Okay, so here we are. And before I start, I, I would like to acknowledge my, my co-authors, in particular Mrs. Ponzuxili, my colleague and wife. She's really responsible for our muscle work and our PhD students, Funtita and Yang Du, who made a lot of the experiments that I will talk about. And um, so in uh, Europe, sustainable animal production is a, a big issue. And in fact, there is a huge demand for uh, products coming from having high quality and coming from healthy and, and happy, happy animals. So animal welfare is really important. On the other hand, you know, high productivity is important not only for economic region, reasons, but also with regard to resource efficiency, as shown here for the greenhouse gases, for example. So the concept of, of balanced breeding takes into account uh, all these different issues and where we do observe some undesirable relationships between uh, functional and production traits often. And when it comes to meat quality, I would state that water holding capacity is uh, probably the most Im important trait. It's because it is uh, obvious to the consumer and so the consumer has a low acceptance for this uh, kind of meat and it is a loss of weight, so it is a loss of gain. And uh, besides the drip loss that we can measure, there are other technolo technological measures that are relate, related to water holding capacity and that are measured in routine in uh, breeding industries. And as you may take from here is that these meat quality, the water holding capacity traits especially, are related to the size and the distribution of muscle fibers. And this, again, is related to growth. So also here we, might, we have a kind of undesirable relationship between muscle size, muscularity, and, and meat quality. In fact, water holding capacity uh, is, can be measured as drip loss. And what happens after that is that in the muscle, the pH uh, goes down and proteins become degraded, so the cells shrink and water can come off. You see that for these traits, there is quite a variation in the population, and it is therefore of interest to address the genetic foundation of this variation. And so our objectives are to look at these meat quality traits, which are comp complex traits, and therefore from global expression analysis, we get usually long lists of relevant genes, and also from mapping and association approaches, we are used to get uh, regions havering quite a number of genes. So we want to get insight into the biological processes in the muscle that affect the process of meat maturation and finally the meat quality. And we want to uh, integrate multiple experiments to get more multiple evidence for the candidacy of some genes and to come up with priority lists of candidate genes. And therefore we are looking at the genotype phenotype map, so at the holistic level we have of got a lot of genes that produce an even higher number of transcripts and proteins and then large, lately affect the uh, uh, phenotype of the animals. And so our interest is to catch up the relevant genes that are uh, uh, responsible for the expression of some uh, um, complex production traits. So now we have the omics techniques available. So we have holistic measures to look at the transcriptome, proteome, and metabolome, and so on. And we can take this as high resolution phenotypes. And in fact, what we are doing for a long time is in linkage studies, and nowadays in genome-wide association studies, is to look for the link between the DNA 
and the phenotype and the nice thing with this you can do this with each trait that is uh, that shows variation because without any knowledge of the biology of, of the trait at all. If it comes to expression analysis, holistic expression analysis, then at least you know you need to know a bit of an idea what tissue is relevant, what stage might be relevant, and so on. And then we have, of course, t tools to do the expression profiling. It's microarrays and MNRSeq. Uh, and I will, of course, focus on the use of microarrays here. And so we are using the Affymetric chips for uh, nearly 10 years now. And we do in routine a quality check using bioconductor and also the expression console that comes from Affymetrics. We do some filtering for presence, absence, of course p-value and often also the standard deviation that we obtain. And for statistical analysis we use bioconductor and uh, uh, JMP genomics, so uh, uh, SAS based uh, software. Uh, the work that I will present today is mainly done with the uh, IWD uh, foresign genome array. We uh, establish a pipeline to do the uh, annotation of this array and to update this regularly. And you might know that these IWD arrays uh, are made of uh, oligonucleotides that are close to the free prime end of the genes, and we use we have. 12 perfect, 11 perfect match and 11 mismatch probes that uh, allow to do a, a, a good standardization of the results. So after we were not very much successful when comparing just 10 high and 10 low uh, animals of our 10 high and 10 low drip animals of our populations. We thought, okay, let's go for more animals and let's take animals that show a nice uh, distribution of this trait. And we came up with 74 F2 animals of our resource population uh, and did the expression analysis of muscle here. And so what we saw is uh, about 1,200 genes that showed uh, expression that was correlated with this trait. And if we look for the functions now, we found that, that the functional categories of membrane proteins, cytosplatin, and structural proteins was upregulated in the high drip loss. So it means that there's probably an increased source of muscle structural proteins that are shrinking during meat maturation. And on the other hand, we observe genes that belong to uh, oxidoreductase activity, electron transport, and uh, generation of uh, uh, energy, lipid metabolism, and so on. And this was down-regulated in the uh, high drip loss, so that means that restrictive, uh, restricted oxidative capacity uh, may result in, in impaired meat quality. And as in this population, we, we had the, the genotypes available it was uh, clear that it's an option to look for EQTL in this population. But first of all, I like to show up some of the pathways, networks that we found. You see here are networks of genes that were regulated or correlated with a trait in a consistent manner, here all green or red and so on. And you see we saw, of course, muscle structural uh, proteins, we saw oxidative phosphorylation, and we saw ubiquitination, and we found this interesting because this is a uh, uh, prote proteolytic system, and proteases my, uh, were calpastatin and calpain were in focus in, in meat science as a reason for low quality, and we thought that it might be interesting to look at this ubiquitination system, which uh, is uh, this kind of cascades where the protein get a tag of ubiquitin uh, molecules and then become degradated. And so we pick a number of candidate genes out of these pathways and look for 
association and just as an exem uh, exemplarily uh, we detected uh, SNPs in these genes. We looked for association with the trait, with drip loss, and we looked for any link of the SNP with the expression of uh, the gene because our aim is always to come and do this kind of triangular relationship where here we have the T allele, uh, meaning a low uh, water holding capacity. The T allele means a high expression, and a high expression is related to a low uh, um, water holding capacity. So a consistent relationship was obtained here. So as I already mentioned, we had the genotype of these animals available, so we could go for the detection of, of EQTL, and in fact, we found some 900 EQTLs at the chromosome-wide level distributed over all chromosomes. So again, as I mentioned at the beginning, a quite a long list. And so what we did then is, coming up with these 1,200 trait-correlated probe sets, we found some 900 which showed an EQTL, and then we looked which of these EQTL uh, is located on a QTL for the trait itself that we have mapped before. So we came up with 100 EQTL in those QTLs for trip loss. And among these, there were eight that showed a cis uh, regulation. So and cis uh, EQTLs are, of course, interesting because now we can expect to have a polymorphism in the gene itself that is related to its expression. So by this, we came up to this short list of candidate genes. And again, just to show you uh, something happened here. Mm -hmm. uh, to show you here an example, one of these genes is uh, ANAC1. We could show for this gene effect on the trade again in different populations. And if we fit this uh, SNP of the gene in the QTL and the EQTL analysis, and you see we have here this nice drop that is not approved, but it's a strong indication that there is really a snippet uh, within the gene that is uh, associated with the gene's expression. And if we look at this, the list of the genes that we uh, develop from this analysis, you see that here we get quite a nice number of associations with those traits that are related to water holding capacity uh, from this list. So what, what, are, what, are we are, what we are doing now is that we try to take advantage of the lowered li linkage disequilibrium that we can observe in commercial populations. So we use animal of a commercial freeway cross that is common in, commonly used in Germany and a population of German landrace animals. And these animals are all performance tested and we took 12 meat quality traits uh, from these animals. Uh, we do a genome-wide association study with a 60K chip and we did expression analysis with the affymetrix arrays of uh, some 200 animals, and then we could again uh, calculate EQTL or ESNPs in this case. And now we try to, to integrate this data from the GWAS. We get trade associated SNPs with certain positions. We can derive positional candidates from this. From the expression analysis, we get trait uh, correlated expressed probe sets and uh, functional candidates come from this. And if we now ask the question, which of the uh, trait associated SNPs is at the same time a ESNP for a trait correlated uh, gene, trait correlated expressed gene that also falls in this uh, area of the genome, we come up with a list of, of nine functional candidate genes that are actually cis -E QTL at two uh, GWAS peaks that we are focusing on. And so at the moment, we are focusing on, on these uh, nine new 
functional candidate genes. So in my second part, I, I would like to uh, report a little bit about our work that we are currently doing by integrating the regulatory level of the microRNAs in, in our studies. And you are familiar with this, the microRNAs are the small molecules that do a kind of a fine tuning of the expression of the uh, mRNAs and um, in order to get expression values from these, we uh, constructed a custom array. We started by a look at the MIA base. It was on, on version 14. At that time, there were only 78 uh, microRNA, porcine microRNAs in the database, but there were some publications available with some more. And we merged this list that gave a sum of 284 microRNAs. And then we took all the other microRNAs from the MIA base and blasted against the, the porcine genome and all with 100% uh, ident identity uh, we, took, we took and finally ended up with an array with 675 uh, probe sets. Meanwhile, we also use the uh, Affymetrix catalog array. We are at the version 3. I just meant, saw on the web page that you have version 4 now. And the version 3 has, uh, you see here, a number of uh, microRNAs for 153 organisms. And we apply it in mouse. So here we have more than 1,100 microRNAs that we can address. Actually, our work in uh, the microRNA stuff is uh, following three lines. So we look for prenatal breed differences, we look for adult trait association, and we developed an in vitro model for validation of our results. So for the breed differences, we uh, do an expression profiling of fetuses with the mRNA array and, and the mRNA array and the mRNA array. And then we try to combine it and to come up with uh, uh, pathways, biological pathways that are relate, that show differences in the, in the two breeds that do differ in meat quality traits. And for the uh, adult association, uh, we uh, again focus on uh, commercial cross, on this uh, PF1 cross, and we do a call again the uh, expression study using the microarrays, and we do an integration of the results. I will show you some more details about this. So, coming to the prenatal uh, mRNA expression stuff. You see what uh, we used here, three pools of six animals each per stage and per breed. And the expression patterns that we get for the microRNA, you can see here, comes up with this uh, heat map where the uh, samples are assigned first according to the stage and in second instance according to breed. So breed differences are really obvious and from here you can see that we uh, observed quite a number of differentially regulated genes which at a certain stage between the breeds, nothing here, but here again at the adult stage and what is probably more interesting is or what we think is more interesting to look at those genes that are differentially regulated from one stage to the other and also in the second breed, but that are private, or that are specific to just the one breed or the other breed, and not those common ones. And if we look now, uh, try to come up with some functions, then we need, of course, to link the microRNAs with some uh, genes. And at this stage, we did it by using the microRNA target filter option of, of ingenuity, and you see there are a number of uh, pathways and biofunctions uh, that have targets of these microRNAs uh, micro that are differentially regulated. And you see that we also can show differences between the breeds 
for some uh, quite interesting uh, pathways. So in second instance, we said, okay, if we do it this way, then we only uh, focus on the knowledge that is in the database, but we do not have a correction for the <coughs> uh, mRNA that are really differentially expressed in, in our experiments. So this is why we also did the mRNA expression analysis in these animals, and here we used individuals, we used six fetuses per stage per breed, and 36 adults, and here we also have the uh, mm, 33, uh, 35 days uh, samples available, so from a 35-day fetus you get just a kind of, of drop and not a, a really a muscle, so you have just one chance to do RNA uh, isolation, and that's the time that we did it. We were not aware of that it might be useful to also obtain microRNA, so we just had mRNA from this stage. But what you can see is that, uh, again, we have quite a number of differentially expressed genes at a certain stage between the breed breeds and also along the development that are private to either one or the other uh, breed. And of course, with the, M with the mRNA, we can directly look in ingenuity for the uh, biofunctions that are associated, and as you might see from here, there are quite a number of uh, biofunction and pathways that are differentially regulated between these breeds. And um, I like here to mention especially the lipid metabolism, that genes of lipid metabolisms are higher expressed in, in the you know, land race breed, and we have dip previously done a uh, similar study using liver samples, and we found the same result in, in liver, so that means uh, already at, at uh, fetal stages, we have this difference in, in lipid metabolism between the uh, more fat lung race breed and the very muscular uh, pia-term breed. And um, using the um, ingenuity me RNA mRNA pairing option, we were able to build up this kind of, of regulatory networks, and um, we took into account here only those where we have pairs of, with, with negative correlation between microRNA and mRNA, because this is a typical function, the typical uh, relationship we, we should have. And what you can take from these uh, pictures is that most of the RNA, M me RNAs target several mRNAs. So here's some me RNA, there is a target, and here are many other targets of one microRNA. And you can, uh, at the other hand, see that most, more than 80% of the mRNAs, so all these here, have more, our target of more than one. Uh, me RNA. Only here are some targets where we have just one me RNA uh, addressing it. Okay, coming to the adult, the analysis in the adults. Here we have 207 animals of uh, the uh, freeway cross. We did the uh, mRNA and mRNA expression analysis with the Affymetrix arrays, again here with the custom me array, and then we did a weighted gene co-expression network analysis, which was here developed by these colleagues here from the US, and actually what this does is that first you have a correlation matrix that is converted to a, an adjacency matrix and then to a topographically overlap matrix which gives you so-called modules of, of co-regulated genes and in this uh, project we also use the software genes uh, target scan and RNA hybrid to uh, look for the targeting of the microRNA at the end of at the end of the mRNAs. So what's Coming up from here is that for the uh, mRNAs, we obtained 
22 models of co-regulated uh, genes. And out of these models, there were five that showed trait correlation. And to come up with this, we used the first component of a principal component analysis as an eigengene uh, value to do the uh, correlation with the trait of interest. And you see here the colored boxes uh, show these uh, correlations of the models here with the different traits. So in fact, there was a model of dark turkeys where we found uh, that this is mainly made up of genes related to glucose metabolism. The model orange uh, covers genes related to inflammatory response. And the models red, black, and tan uh, cover genes that are related to mitochondrial metabolism and oxidative phosphorylation. On the other hand, for the microRNAs, we only find uh, nine modules, and there were only two with the trait correlation at a less stringent level. And uh, probably we, we do not expect here more direct uh, correlations between the microRNAs and the traits because it is in the biological pathways more distant, of course, and, of, and we do not expect that much correlated expression of microRNAs, so we have this lower number of models. So we also look for uh, correlations of the single microRNAs with, with traits, and we found quite a number here. So what we can do with this data now is uh, looking for pairs of correlation of microRNAs and mRNAs. And you see we found some nearly 6,000 of these pairs. Out of this, we again focus of, on those with negative correlations, close to 2,000. And then we ask which of these are out of models that showed a trait correlation that were 286. And then we tested these, uh, whether we get a positive prediction uh, for this pairing of the microRNA and the mRNA using target scan and mRNA hybrid. And at the end, we found that uh, 73 of these uh, mRNA, mRNA pay, uh, pairs uh, are predicted for, from these uh, programs. We can do it, of course, the other way around, looking at what gives, uh, what, what of these pairs, which of these pairs that we had uh, are related to the two models that we obtained from the microRNAs, and there were 62 pairs that uh, uh, came from these trait-correlated modules. And interestingly, these were targets of genes that are related to ubiquitin again and to protein catalytic processes. So at the end, what we found is that uh, genes of molecular roots of ubiquitination, glucose metabolism, oxidative phosphorylation, extracellular matrix, and muscle structure were here trait regulated uh, expressed. And, um, and what we are doing now is uh, in order to validate the microRNAs that, that we found to be interesting, we use the cell culture the, uh, that comes from mouse. It's a, a, a myoblast cell, C2, uh, C11. And we did this culture ma culturing and differentiation of the cells. We monitor this uh, by microscopy, by looking at some marker genes for uh, <coughs> uh, differentiation. And we measure the ATP uh, amount in these cells as a surrogate marker for the oxidative phosphorylation. And currently now we do transfection mRNA mini <coughs> with, with these cells. And just to give you an example, we can show in this uh, in vitro model the number of mRNAs that are downregulated 
along the growth and others are upregulated and this correlates to the ATP amounts in the cells and if we do an mRNA uh, mimic here with the mRNA 4233P you see the amount of the mRNA, the mRNA is increased at the same time we uh, have this uh, correlation with the ATP uh, amount in the cells and we can show that uh, there is an impact on the regulation of genes out of the mitochondrial energy metabolism. And so this is what we are currently using to, to validate um, our results. And with this I would like to come to an end and say of course you know DNA contains information what can happen and the manifestation of the genetic pot uh, potential works along the genotype phenotype map and the integration of omics analyzed at different levels helps us to detect molecular roots that contribute to trait expression and this will also allow to come up to uh, DNA markers and causal genes that might be used in breeding and Microarrays are, uh, provide a broad insight into the relationship of the transcriptome and the complex traits and they allow to derive new hypotheses on the biology of a trait and to pick candidate genes and I think that the accumulating results from next gen sequencing will enable the design of, of more application specific arrays and of whole transcriptome arrays with an increasing level of completeness. And you might have a look at our poster 600, uh, where we have an example of an, an tiling array that, that we uh, developed for a certain QTL reach. So with this, I like to acknowledge uh, the founding agency, the DFG, for these projects, uh, for other groups that were working in this uh, research group are from Professor Wicke, Professor Leib, and Professor Schellander and his teams. And in my group, Dr. Brunner and Dr. Jäger doing the uh, cell culture and um, computer stuff. And our technicians, especially Mrs. Jugat is our engineer. She is doing all our microarrays. And with this, I'd like to thank for your attention. Thank you.